Early in January, 1865, a great war party composed of Cheyennes, Sioux, and Arapahoes started north from the Smoky Hill River. On the night of January 6th, they camped near Julesburg, an important point on the Overland stage route. Close by was Fort Rankin, garrisoned by a troop of 7th Iowa Cavalry. Early next morning, a little party of Cheyennes and Sioux, seven in all, headed by Big Crow, a famous Cheyenne warrior, rode out of the ravine near the fort and charged some post employees who were working outside the stockade. The men ran inside, and the cavalry leaped to horse to chastise the rash hostiles. At top speed, the troopers chased the seven Indians toward the sand hills about two miles away. Captain O'Brien hoped to catch the Redskin before they reached the safety of those hills. Try as they might, they could not catch up with their quarry, although they always seemed almost to overtake them. Then, just as they reached the sand hills, the crest suddenly sprouted war bonnets and lances. It was an old Indian trick. The seven Indians were a decoy. It was a flight for life now. O'Brien's force came within an eyelash of being annihilated. As it was, the Indians killed a sergeant, 14 privates and four civilians, 18 men, in the wild dash for the fort. Around the stockade rode the red men, yelling and taunting. Then they plundered the nearby town of Julesburg. Nobody was killed in the settlement because all took refuge in the fort before the Indians got there. On January 28th, the Indians again struck the stage line when they surrounded and set fire to Harlow's ranch, killed two men and carried off a woman. On the same day, they raided three other places, burning buildings, setting hay on fire, looting stores, and paralyzing the whole stage line for weeks. In this raid, the Cheyennes got a single piece of vengeance. Nine men recently discharged from the 3rd Colorado Cavalry, which took part in the Sand Creek Massacre, were caught by the war party. They were on their way east. The Indians killed them all. When their valises were opened, the Indians found two scalps of their own people which they recognized by the hair ornaments. They were so furious that they cut the dead men, literally to pieces. In the next two weeks, the Allied tribes attacked and burned the Beaver Creek State Station, the Morrison Ranch where seven men were killed and Mrs. Morrison and her child carried off, the Wisconsin Ranch, the Washington Ranch, the Lillian Springs Ranch, Gittrell's Ranch, Moore's Ranch, and many others. Three wagon trains headed west on the Oregon Trail were captured and looted. In a second raid on Julesburg, they burned the place to the ground while the soldiers watched helplessly from Fort Rankin, a mile away. And so it went on, as it had since 1862, the Southern Cheyenne making the settlers pay with their lives, furnishing much of the worst fighting for the troops in what became known as the Powder River Campaign of 1865. In mid-July of that summer, the Cheyennes appeared near the Platte Bridge, where there was a stockade garrisoned by some Kansas cavalry. There was a skirmish near the fort, then the Indians drew off and hid on the other side of the Platte. A wagon train with a small military escort was coming down the river to the post, and Lieutenant Casper Collins, with a detachment, was dispatched to meet it. Not an Indian was in sight. In fact, those at the fort thought that they had cleared out of the country. With no thought of the immediate danger, Collins led his men across the bridge and up the flat. As if they had risen from the ground, the Cheyennes suddenly appeared, cutting the soldiers off from the bridge. Collins was fearless. He had been ordered to go to the wagon train, so he continued his march. Then a second, even larger mass of warriors rose out of a ravine on his front. At first, the young officer tried to fight his way forward. The numbers of Indians steadily increased. At last, he gave the order to fall back. The Cheyenne still blocked his way to the bridge. Collins tried to cut his way through. He rode his men right into a mass of yelling Cheyenne. An arrow struck the lieutenant on the forehead and hung quivering there, but still he fought his way forward. A few yards further, he was beaten from his horse and killed. Only a remnant of his command won their way through to the bridge. The rest were dead and their scalps in Cheyenne hands. There is some evidence that the young Lieutenant Casper Collins was tortured to death. A.J. Mockler of Casper, Wyoming, who probably knows more about this fight than any other man, says that the lieutenant's face had been blasted off by powder poured in his mouth and then touched off. 
Mr. Mockler, has an interesting discussion on this affair in his book, Transition of the West. In the meantime, the wagon train continued its slow journey toward the fort, ignorant of the painted death ahead. Sergeant Custard, a hard-faced old veteran, was in command. The booming of cannon when they were almost inside of the fort was their first intimation of danger. Custard had 24 men. He sent five of them, under Corporal James W. Schrader, forward to see what was going on. Scarcely was the detail clear of the wagon train when a swarm of Indians rode out of the same ravine where they ambushed Lieutenant Collins and lashed their ponies after the soldiers. There was no chance to get back to Custard. The troops raced for the fort. As they jumped their horses into the stream to ford it, Private James Balu was shot from the saddle and fell into the river. His body was never recovered. The rest got across, but on the other bank, Edwin Summers was killed. Corporal Schrader, with Privates Brian Swaim and Henry Smith, after two hours of alternate running and hiding in the brush of the river bottom, finally reached the fort, alive. In the meantime, Custer, seeing his advance guard cut off, corralled his wagons. Many Indians came riding toward him. They were returning from killing Collins and his men. Around the train, they swept in a tempest of noise, while puffs of smoke spurted from the wagons. Here and there, warriors fell to the ground. The Cheyennes drew back out of range. The soldiers probably breathed more freely. A repulse like that generally meant the end of an Indian attack on the Great Plains. But these were not ordinary Indians. They were Cheyennes, seeking still further satisfaction from the white man for Sand Creek. A gigantic warrior wearing a handsome war bonnet now appeared, riding slowly toward the train. He was Roman Nose, most noted of all the Cheyennes. His proper name was Souts, the Bat, but his nose was hooked like the beak of a fierce bird of prey, and the white man dubbed him Roman Nose. His own people accepted the sobriquet and translated it into their own tongue, Wakini, or Hook Nose. Few Indians on the plains were his equal in strength or courage. He towered six feet three inches in his moccasins and weighed 230 pounds without a surplus ounce of flesh. In addition, he was a natural leader. Roman Nose habitually took great risks in battle. He believed himself invulnerable due to the sacred war bonnet which he always wore and which was never put on without elaborate ritual. Because of this belief, he had performed so many daring exploits that he was famous throughout the frontier. The appearance of Romanos at once put a different complexion on the fight. After his leisurely survey of the corral, he told his warriors to dismount. Every man with a gun, and due to the recent raids, many were now so armed, crept up close to the wagons and opened a devastating fire upon them. The troopers simply melted away, about three o'clock in the afternoon, Roman Nose stopped the shooting. Spurring forward, he rode all alone around the wagons, very close to draw fire. But not a shot answered his challenge. Then Roman Nose dared to enter the circle himself. It was a scene of carnage. Every soldier was dead or badly wounded. The Cheyennes rushed in and killed all who were still living. Already migrated north out of Colorado due to the massacre at Sand Creek, the Cheyennes continued their northward migration in order to consolidate with their newfound allies, the Dakota, or the Yankton, and the Teton, or Lakota, collectively better known as the Sioux. With the Civil War being some months ended, General Patrick E. Connor, commanding a new district of the Plains, led the largest expedition of volunteer troops ever sent against the Indians. The Powder River Expedition was organized in the summer of 1865 at Fort Laramie in four columns. The right, under Colonel Nelson Cole of the 2nd Missouri Light Artillery, included eight companies of his regiment equipped as cavalry and a section of three-inch rifled guns, and eight companies of the 13th Missouri Cavalry, totaling 800 men. The center, under Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Walker of the 16th Kansas Cavalry, consisted of 600 men of that regiment. Walker was a veteran of Bleeding Kansas and, although slightly crippled by a hip ailment, had won a reputation as a fighting man. The left was commanded by Colonel J.H. Kidd of the 6th Michigan Cavalry, who with his regiment had served under Major General George A. Custer in the Civil War's Eastern Campaigns. 
He had six companies of his regiment totaling 200 men, 90 of the 7th Iowa Cavalry, 90 of the 11th Ohio Cavalry, and 95 Pawnee Scouts. The 4th, or West Column, was commanded by Captain Albert Brown of the 2nd California Cavalry, with two companies, 116 men, of that regiment, and a company of Omaha and Winnebago Scouts, under Captain E. W. Nash. General Connor himself accompanied the left and west columns with Jim Bridger, the famous mountain man, as scout. The total force was 3,000 men short of what had been planned due to the fact that many volunteers had demanded their discharges on the ground that the Civil War was ended. Others, in the words of Major General Grenville M. Dodge, commanding the Department of Missouri, were mutinous, dissatisfied, and inefficient. General Connor's strategy was for three columns of soldiers to march into the Powder River country. The right column, composed of 1,400 Missourians and 140 wagons, commanded by Colonel Nelson D. Cole, was to march from Omaha, Nebraska and follow the Lup River westward to the Black Hills, meeting up with Connor near the Powder River. The center column, consisting of 600 Kansas cavalrymen led by Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Walker, was to head north from Fort Laramie and traverse the country west of the Black Hills. The left and west columns, composed of soldiers from California, Iowa, Michigan, Nebraska, and Ohio, along with Indian scouts and a wagon train, would move toward the Powder River with the goal of establishing a fort near the Bozeman Trail. All three columns were to unite at the new fort. At the same time, James A. Sawyers was leading a federally funded expedition authorized to build a road from Neobrara, Nebraska on the Missouri River to Virginia City, Montana. With a military escort, the expedition was traveling over the Bozeman Trail while Connor was campaigning in the Powder River Basin. The Powder River campaign against the Cheyenne and Lakota Sioux had been in the planning stages all spring and early summer of 1865. Finally, it got underway after interminable supply delays when Brigadier General Patrick E. Connor led the left column out of Fort Laramie, Wyoming on July 30, 1865. While part of the troops looked for a place to build a post, Captain Frank North led his Pawnee scouts down the Powder River. On August 13th, near Crazy Woman's Fork, Captain North chased a war party until he became separated from the rest of his troops. Shooting his horse out from under him, North found himself in a desperate situation. However, he was saved when another Pawnee scout named Bob White rode up upon him. Though North ordered White to go for help, the scout refused, saying, Me heap brave, me no run, you and me kill em plenty Sioux, that better. A brief skirmish ensued when the scouts were thought to have wounded a few warriors before other scouts arrived, and the skirmish ended. Hoping to pioneer and publicize a shorter route to Montana during its gold-filled heydays, the prominent Iowa merchant, James Sawyers, organized an expedition. The expedition team was comprised of 53 men, 15 wagons, and 90 oxen. Joining them was an immigrant train of five wagons and 36 freight wagons owned by C.E. Hedges and Company of Sioux City, Iowa. This large group was escorted by Captain George Williford, leading 143 men of volunteer Dakota Cavalry. The party traveled slowly up the Neobrara River, struggling through sand hills with temperatures climbing over 100 degrees. By the time they reached the badlands of the Upper White River, Captain Williford was running out of provisions and sent 15 men to Fort Laramie, about 75 miles southeast, for needed supplies on July 21st. By August 9th, the expedition had reached the Bell Forge River and decided to strike northwest to Powder River. However, they found the next 30 miles very rough with little water, which convinced Sawyers that it was not a place for a wagon road. He turned the wagon train around. Along the way, they were harassed by Sioux and Cheyenne warriors. On August 13th, the expedition planned to camp on Bone Pile Creek, about 10 miles southwest of present-day Gillette, Wyoming. However, before they arrived, a band of Cheyenne killed Nathaniel D. Hedges, a 19-year-old partner in the freighting firm, and ran off eight horses about a mile and a half from the intended campsite. When they reached the campsite, the group corralled their wagons and dug in to protect themselves from further attacks. They buried hedges in the center of the corral and concealed the grave. 
The next day, the Indians reappeared and dashed for the horses, but were driven off. On the 15th, about 500 Sioux and Cheyenne warriors circled the camp and began shooting. The expedition men wanted to negotiate with the Indians and give them supplies. Captain George Williford objected to this idea, doubting that it would work. However, a wagon load of supplies, which included sugar, bacon, coffee, flour, and tobacco, were given to the warriors. When the wagons began to move again, Williford proved correct. As they were getting underway, a large group attacked the train, killing two soldiers, John Ross and Anthony Nelson. Fighting back, two of the warriors were killed. Nelson's body was the only recovered, and he was buried alongside Hedges. Ross's body could not be found. The warriors backed off, and the expedition continued. The left column, accompanied by General Connor, moved up the Bozeman Trail and arrived in the Powder River country on August 11th. They scouted for a suitable site to build a new post, and construction of Fort Connor, later renamed Fort Reno, began. While Captain Frank North, leading a group of volunteers and his Pawnee scouts, kept up a vigilant search for hostile Indians in northeastern Wyoming, they trailed a band of Cheyenne who were heading north. The trail showed they were tracking a party of 40 horses and mules along with Travoy. They caught up with them on the Powder River about 50 miles north of the just days old Fort Connor. Spying the Pawnee scouts, the Cheyenne thought the approaching Indians were friendly and made no hostile moves. However, the Pawnee suddenly charged in, surprising the Cheyenne and killing 27, including Yellow Woman, who was the stepmother of George Bent. North scouts lost four horses, but captured 18 horses and 17 mules, many with government brands showing that they had been taken in the Battle of Platte Bridge. On the 22nd of August, General Connor and his men, consisting of about 180 soldiers and 95 Pawnee scouts, continued north from Fort Connor, traveling along the east edge of the Bighorn Mountains to the Tongue River, and downstream toward the rendezvous scheduled with the other parties of the expedition. The group encountered only minor skirmishing along the way. However, on August 28th, the Pawnee scouts brought word of an Arapaho village some 40 miles upstream at the head of Tongue River. The column was then located on Prairie Dog Creek, and Connor prepared to make an attack. Following a night march, the U.S. Cavalry attacked Chief Black Bear's Arapaho camp early in the morning of August 29th, while the Indians were packing to move. Chief Black Bear and many warriors were away fighting the Crow along the Bighorn River, but Medicine Man and some older men and women and children were still in the camp. The warriors made a stand while their families scattered. The soldiers overran the camp and destroyed the village and pushed the Indians 10 miles up Wolf Creek. The Indians fought a desperate rear guard action protecting their families, and only artillery saved the soldiers from disaster. General Connor himself personally led the pursuit until he found that he had outdistanced all except 14 of his command, at which point the Arapaho turned on him. Fortunately, as he fell back fighting all the way, he was reinforced by soldiers he had left behind and so was able to renew the running fight until the village was swept clean of hostiles. Captain Henry E. Palmer of the 11th Kansas Cavalry said of the fight, I was in the village amid a hand-to-hand -hand fight with warriors and their squaws, for many of the female portions of this band did as brave fighting as their savage lords. Unfortunately for the women and children, our men had no time to direct their aim. Squaws and children, as well as warriors, fell among the dead and wounded. Indian casualties included 54 warriors, although General Connor only reported 35 warriors killed. Another 500 to 1,000 horses were also seized, and the soldiers captured 18 women and children, but later released them. Connor lost two soldiers and three scouts, with another seven soldiers wounded. As the soldiers withdrew, the Indians advanced, recaptured several ponies, and continued the harassing the column for several days. On August 31st, two days after General Connor's victory at the Battle of Tongue River, James Sawyer's surveying party was attacked by Arapaho Indians in retaliation for Connor's attack on Black Bear's village. The party was besieged for 13 days until the surveyors were rescued by General Connor's expedition force. In the meantime, 
while Connor's left column was having some moderate success, his center and right columns, led by Colonel Samuel Walker and Colonel Nelson Cole respectively, were not. During their expeditions, they were troubled by mutinous soldiers, terrible weather, lack of quality guides, low supplies, and attacks on the Powder River in Montana. Colonel Cole's right column marched 1,200 miles in 82 days from Omaha through the Badlands and Black Hills, losing 12 killed and two missing in four fights with the Indians. To his misfortune, however, a severe sleet storm resulted in the loss of 414 horses within 36 hours. Cole had already lost 225 horses and mules in a previous storm and had to abandon most of his wagons. When Colonel Walker's center column reached the mouth of the Dry Fork of the Powder River on September 8th, he was attacked by a combined force of Sioux, Arapaho, and Cheyenne warriors. Colonel Cole, who had since linked up with Colonel Walker, came to his aid. Of this engagement, Cole estimated that 200 to 300 Indians were killed and wounded. Walker, more modestly reported, as to the number of Indians killed in our long fight with them, I cannot say as we killed one. I saw a number fall, but they were at once carried off. A snowstorm during the night of September 8th to 9th caused further problems for the soldiers, most of whom were now on foot, in rags, and reduced to eating raw horse meat. On September 13th, two scouts from Brigadier General Connor's column found Walker's and Cole's column and informed them of the newly established Fort Connor on the Powder River. Colonels Cole and Walker failed to make junction with Connor until their men were exhausted and starving. Forced to exist on the meat of their few surviving horses, they trickled in to the newly established Fort Connor on September 20th. Colonel Cole had lost over 600 of his horses, while Walker had lost 225 horses and 25 of his mules. Although General Connor declared the expedition to be a tactical success, the expedition failed to decisively defeat or to intimidate the Indians. George Bent, a participant in the fighting on September 8th, stated that the Lakota would have annihilated Cole's and Walker's columns had they possessed more good firearms. The Indian resistance to travelers on the Bozeman Trail became more determined than ever, and the government temporarily closed the Bozeman and Oregon Trail to emigrants heading west. As for the Sioux and their newfound allies, the Cheyenne and Arapaho, more numbered and better equipped than ever, bided their time through the winter of 1865 until spring of 1866, whereupon they would unleash a counteroffensive against the United States, commonly referred to as Red Cloud's War. <laughs>